Nazgan music is a big part of the heritage of American music uh, because of the history of African Americans. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. This week, Margaret Henningsen joins us to discuss Milwaukee's history and we'll review the daddy-daughter dance. We'll talk with actor Gerard Haynes, who plays Tom Robinson in the Milwaukee Reps production of To Kill a Mockingbird. And we have some tickets to give away to that production as well. But first, we recently got a taste of West African music when the African Music Ensemble, under the direction of Sowa Menza, performed at UWM. Our Lady Collins was there. African music is one of the musics that, you know, uh, is alive. And African music is a big part of the heritage of American music uh, because of the history of African Americans. And so indigenous American music, outside Native American music, includes a lot of music from Africa, as well as music from Europe. This is the McAllister College African Music Ensemble under the direction of Soa Menza. From Ghana, West Africa, Menza is a master drummer, which means he has knowledge of non-traditional as well as traditional music. But also knows the norms and the, the customs and traditions. Uh, they know repertoire boundaries, they know uh, how to lead certain ceremonies and so on and so forth. So it's not just a musical role. Uh, the, the musical role is taken for granted. It should be able to, you know, play well and be able to lead, you know, uh, an ensemble. But it should also uh, have the non-musical knowledge, that is the knowledge of oral history. I take the music with me. When I was, I went to, I was teaching in Nigeria. I still directed, you know, the African ensembles there. Uh, we did a lot of Nigerian music, but I also taught them Ghanaian music. And so coming to the United States, I needed to play my music. And when I started teaching it, I also got a lot of good response that a lot of Americans of all racial backgrounds like the music. Um, and so that was enough motivation to do it. The name of what the ensemble is playing is called a dinku, which is the name of the calabash gourd instrument being used. A dinku music is traditionally played by women's social clubs in Ghana. But that is a common thing. Most organizations, social organizations, occupational groups, just any group, usually traditionally have their own music that they perform. And so if, for instance, the Lions Club were you know, an organization in, in Ghana or somewhere in Africa, they will have Lions music. So when they meet, part of the meeting, they will spend practicing their music, teaching new members, composing new songs, organizing it. And when they have a function, they take their music with them and go play. They don't go bring a band from outside. On the other hand, if a member has something going on in their family and the group is going to go support them, they can take the music and go support them. He said African music is important to education because it teaches discipline. The nature of the music uh, helps people to focus and also, you know, um, also learn community building and so on. Because African music is participatory and it's about the community. The music itself is played like that. You can play music well if, if you can work on a team with other performers. You can play music well if you don't focus and concentrate any music, you know, from anywhere. Since his training includes European music, he plays the piano, flute, 
saxophone, and violin. Menza has performed throughout the country, including Carnegie Hall in New York, and he is a composer. I compose music in the style of traditional Africa. So I have pieces that people hear and they think is being in Africa for ages. But, but if you go to Africa, people still compose new music in the style, and I do that. Uh, but because of my training, too, I also compose for orchestras and bands and, and choirs. The African Music Ensemble under the direction of Soa Menza, played and sang different songs in the Canadian languages of Akan and Ga, on the different instruments, adinkum, the water drums, and the gile, which is the grandparent of the mallet keyboard. They perform music you would hear if you were to visit Ghana. Dr. Carter G. Woodson is an African-American historian and the founder of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. He was also a founder of the Journal of Negro History, which is now the Journal of African-American History. In 1926, he pioneered the celebration of Negro History Week, which has become Black History Month or African-American History Month. At MPTV, we celebrate African-American history all year long. But here are, a, here are a preview of some special programs airing within the next week that you might find interesting. You can find the full list of programs on the Black Nouveau page of MPTV's website. It's a film festival in your living room. Is it time to retire Black History Month? Filmmaker Shakri Tillman thinks so. Why would you want to do that? He takes an insightful and amusing look. I mean, they are selling something. At race. You know we're, we are in business to make money. And equality in the land of the free. And discovers that Black History Month is more than a month. See it Sunday at 10 p.m. on MPTV 10 HD. Music seemed to be our way out. Pop put an instrument in your hand and you played. Yeah, I was called a diva. Were you a diva? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Saturday morning at 9 on MPTV 36.1. When we talk about Milwaukee's black history and the people who have made an impact, our guest is definitely on the A-list. Margaret Henderson is currently the executive director of the Women's Fund of Greater Milwaukee. Ms. Henderson, welcome to Black Nouveau, ma'am. Thank you, Milton. I'm glad to be here. Ms. Henderson, you've been involved in a variety of activities here in Milwaukee. Let's start by talking about you helping to establish the Black Student Union at UWM. Oh, you really went way back on me, didn't you? <laughs> uh, that was back in the 60s. And as you know, there was a lot of turmoil in our country at that time. And the movement was really picked up by college students all across the United States. And it was primarily driven by the fact that on those college campuses, black students did not have a place of their own. They didn't have an office. They couldn't have activities. And so here in Milwaukee at UWM, we decided that we needed to have a black student union to address some of the issues that were happening on the campus. And unfortunately, there was racism and discrimination occurring on that campus, both within the administration and the student body and in the community in general. Now, you were accused of starting a riot at UWM, <laughs> and oh, you no. know, your, your dad got involved. Talk about that briefly for me. Oh, my father was amazing. I actually was expelled from UWM, and it was not a riot. It was uh, more of a demonstration, mm -hmm. but we were fighting for our rights, and the school said that between that and my grades, they were gonna expel me, not just from UWM, but from the entire system. Okay. And uh, I actually was getting up every day and leaving the house like I was going to school. Uh -huh. And then a letter came addressed to me, but because it came to my father's house, he opened it <laughs> and <laughs> found out that I had been expelled. The next day, I found myself sitting in the dean's office with my father, who uh, very 
in a very quiet manner, explained to him how I was the oldest of his 10 children, setting a role model kind of a thing mm -hmm. for my brothers and sisters, and uh, that I had the right to demonstrate and march and fight for my rights of on the campus and that they should let me back into school. It's very obvious he had a tremendous influence on your, he on your life. He did. He really did. You know, you, you didn't cross George more than <laughs> one time. <laughs> and I broke all of his rules. Yeah. I was born on his birthday. Okay. He often would say to people, I was the worst president okay. he ever got. <laughs> he didn't mean it, though. Okay. And um, But through his efforts, I got back into UWM okay. yeah. and ended up graduating with honors. I'm sure they're still trying to gotcha. figure out how I managed to do that. But I remember how proud he was of gotcha. me that day. But after watching him sit there and basically begging for me to get back into the college, I said that will never, okay. I will never put him in that position okay. again. Now before you got involved in banking, you were involved in real estate. Could you talk about that very briefly for me? I love that. I was a real estate broker. I still am a real estate broker, although I don't actively practice. And I discovered um, that I had to take my activism into the real estate industry. I taught a mandatory class around fair housing and fair lending, but the primary reason I loved it is that most of my customers were uh, single moms with children who no other real estate agents seem to want to work with, and um, many of them are still in those homes I put them in. A lot of them own more than one home because they followed the advice they were given about real estate as a way to build your financial wealth. Now, within I loved that it. Now, within that context, that is one of the reasons why you founded Legacy Bank. That's Talk right. about that very briefly for me. That uh, was driven by the fact that many of my customers who were women, black, white, Hispanic, Hmong, it was very difficult for them to get a uh, loan. I also had read some very daunting statistics about Milwaukee. We were at the bottom of the list when it came to lending, mm -hmm. and blacks were four times as often as whites to be denied when you compared apples to apples when they tried to get a mortgage loan. And uh, so the day after my 50th birthday, I had a moment of temporary insanity <laughs> and said, you know, if they won't gotcha. uh, give us loans, then I'll start my own bank okay. and see if we can make it work better. Okay. And that's basically what happened with Legacy Bank. Now, Carl, you're the executive director of the Women's Fund. Uh, what are your primary goals? Briefly, because I have a few more things. I have a limited amount of time. Okay. Uh, briefly, we raise funds. We're a community foundation, and we raise funds that fund programs that work on social change issues for women and girls. And my goal is to keep that going, but to build on it, mm -hmm to uh, double or triple or even quadruple the amount of money that we raise so that we're able to fund more activities that uh, help to keep the gains that women have made over the last 20, 25 years. And as you know, there's been an assault on a lot of things related to women, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that the status quo remains. Briefly, has Milwaukee become a better place for African Americans? Uh, having lived here all my life and being a native of Milwaukee, I'd have to say no. Mm -hmm that I've seen a lot of the gains that blacks made when they came here from the South and there was plenty of work for mm -hmm. everybody to becoming known as a welfare state, mm -hmm. to having one of the, the worst educational systems in the country. Now that is getting better. I mm -hmm. have to say that Dr. Thornton is doing an amazing job yeah. with a lot of people, but overall I think that uh, blacks are not faring as well here as they used to. I know that there are uh, efforts to make things better, but there's so much more that can be accomplished. Okay. When you live in a city where the black unemployment rate for males is 50%, that means that every other black male you see when you're walking down the street is unemployed. Mm -hmm. That has to be fixed. Okay. Miss Henderson, thank you so much for joining us. On the thank program. you. The ninth annual Daddy Daughter Dance is coming up this Saturday at North Division High School. We thought you would enjoy looking back at our coverage of that event. Back when I was a child Before life removed all the innocence Well, it's a daddy-daughter dance, and the, the dance is basically designed to give the dads an opportunity to spend some quality time with their young, young ladies of their lives. It's important because a daughter's relationship with her dad usually kind of tell, is a telltale sign of the type of man she'll end up marrying or spending the rest of her life with. And so on a snowy Saturday in February, dozens of dads and daughters came together at North Division High School for an evening of dancing, food, games, and bonding. 
but this is our first official date. You know, I just want to show them some different things and uh, just want them to grow up right, you know, with, with some options in. And this is our, our prerequisite in showing them how they should be treated on the evening out. I think that's important because I just think that we have a lot of not only young ladies but young men that are not giving the, the proper examples and, and the right um, requirements that they should be holding their potential mates up to. So this is a beginning process of learning and teaching my daughters how and what to expect. I have two, two daughters and I have a deceased son who passed at four months and uh, my favorite job is being daddy. It's real important because, you know, I get to dance with my daughter and I get to meet other fathers that are with their daughters and you see a lot of different different people that are also they're going through struggles but at the same time they're not giving up hope you know and that's what counts i mean i love my kids a lot and you know and it's just me giving back as a father that i never had a father it's real special for me just to see my daughter you know dance with me for the first time this was the sixth annual daddy daughter dance and the second time the milwaukee fatherhood initiative partnered with Milwaukee Recreation. I got involved with the Fatherhood Initiative uh, about two years ago. And then once I got involved with them, they learned of the, the daddy-daughter dance. Uh, I met with Terrence and he really wanted to get involved. And so we partnered two years ago. And uh, this is our second year partnering. And uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful partnership. This year, the dance featured special guests, young ladies without father figures in their lives from local shelters and group homes. They were escorted by volunteer sheriffs, police officers, and firemen. I'm here because I feel it's extremely important to come out and support the young ladies. Um, when I was asked to be a part of this, as far as being a chaperone for some of the young ladies without fathers, I uh, grew up as, since I was three years old without a mother. So as a young boy without a mother and not being able to go to those functions and do different things, I understand the importance of it. And to see a young lady who doesn't have a father, you know, they need that other support system. And so I'm here to, for the night, if nothing else, just to try to provide that support system for them and let them know that there are um, men of color in this community who care a tremendous deal about them and their well-being. It was extremely important for the community, especially in these times. Um, I mean, we are very fortunate and very blessed and honored to have an African-American president. However, you know, things still have a, a ways to go before they get better. And the only way they're going to get better is if we stand together as a community and help one another out. And so you have to start, start with baby steps and letting the young ladies see that, you know, you don't have to just rely on Mr. Obama or President Obama, excuse me, but there are people right here in your community who are very concerned about you and want to help you with your education, your spirituality, and just your growth overall. And that's what we're here for. I thought it was an excellent way for uh, the League of Martin and uh, a member of the police department to support a very worthwhile uh, event. I know it's important because it gives uh, the, the young ladies uh, an actual role model that they can connect with, uh, that they would normally see from a distance, they could see them up close, you know, and interact with them and, and, and have a personal relationship with them. Well, I think it's important for us in the uh, public service to present proper role models to the children so we could give them some idea of what we do and, and maybe they might want to be involved in a, a career field uh, like us. I have a son. Um, as a matter of fact, when we had the introduction a couple of days ago, when we got to meet the ladies as a whole, I brought him with me and he really enjoyed it. He, he thought it was very nice and he was very, oh dad, I'm very proud of you. Yeah. So that was something in itself. I mean, for nine years old, for him to understand the importance of me giving my time to other individuals was extremely important. So I'm glad that he understands. How I'd love, love to dance with my father again. One critic has said that To Kill a Mockingbird is probably the most widely read book on race in America. It won a Pulitzer Prize in the 1960s, 
The film version won three Oscars, and now a stage version is playing at the Milwaukee Rep through March 11th. We are joined now by Gerard Haynes, who plays Tom Robinson in the Rep's version. Welcome to Black Nouveau. Thank you for having me. Gerard, for people who aren't familiar with the book or the play, what is the play about? Well, um, To Kill a Mockingbird is such a pivotal piece because it, it, it explores so many different dynamics. You know, of course, black and white, but also um, uh, leading by example. Um, Mr. Atticus Finch is hit with the dilemma of, um, you know, basically uh, representing um, an African-American male who was accused of rape back in the 1930s, which is, you know, um, death is, is, is the outcome found guilty. And by him taking on this case, he puts himself and his family at risk. But, um, so he's sort of a hero for that, for that matter. And it's told through the eyes of Jim and Scout, uh, which are his kids. And his kids get to see uh, the father go through these different stages. And from that, they learn, um, they learn a lot of things from that as well. So it's, it's a great book, a great piece. Um, I know I, the movie was phenomenal, yeah. and I read the book back in high school. I just uh -huh. dated myself, but that's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's a great piece of literature. Uh -huh. How did you find your character in this book? Because you're under 30, so <laughs> tell me how that worked for you. Yeah, that was, that was a process. Um, born under, well, born in this generation, uh, it, it was very tough because in my generation, I didn't have to endure a lot of those things that they may have in the 1930s. So I had, you know, uh, my father, though, um, from Durant, he's from Durant, Mississippi. Um, I turned to him. Um, I looked a lot of things up, read some books, um, a book called The New Jim Crow by uh, Michelle Alexander, which is very good, good and gives you a great insight of, of what's going on. I just had to desensitize myself about what's, what I'm a part of and actually put myself in that era. Um, it was a process, but with the help of Aaron Posner and the rest of my uh, cast, which is tremendous. Um, we were able to find different layers and so. How do you think um, Milwaukee audiences will feel and think about this this play? Mm, well, from from what I heard, they responded very well because I think the play does a great job of not sugarcoating anything. Um, we hit on the things that make you uncomfortable and um, that sometimes can be a solution to things. Um, being in a, a world where race still kind of matters, um, and we hit on those topics, hit on those topics, and a lot of people in the audience, black, white, um, uh, Mexican, uh, we, we deal with these issues at first hand, and the kids are a part of it as well. So it's like, wow, you know. Um, it makes you uncomfortable, but everybody knows uncomfortable means change, and change is good, so. So do you think Milwaukee audiences I think are they, ready for oh, this dialogue on stage, up front, personal? They have no choice. You got to be ready because uh, that's what it is. <laughs> that's what it is. Well, as I said earlier, you're under, you're under 30. Mm -hmm. uh, what prompted you to become an actor? We were talking about <laughs> that in the dressing room. So yeah. just, you know, we got a couple minutes here. Uh -huh. share, share how you became an actor. <clears throat> well... I didn't have any theater background or film background, but uh, honestly, when I was out of school and I was was a basketball player and I really loved basketball, but at the time things weren't going as well as I planned, I just woke up one morning and decided to really take a class down at uh, Acting Studio Chicago. I think it was like an audition class and um, and I just haven't looked back. But, you know, that's my conservatory, um, Acting Studio Chicago, because that's where I first started which is about a year and a half ago, and, uh, and took some more classes after that, and now I'm here, so. It, so college, on a basketball scholarship, yes. decided, oh, let me search the internet, see what else is going on <laughs> out in the world, pull up acting classes, yeah. take some acting classes, mm -hmm. and land a great role mm -hmm. in the Milwaukee Rep production. Mm -hmm. And this is your first professional? Yeah, first big, well, uh, but everything is glory to God. It's, it's not me. It's glory to him, of course. Um, but yes, um, I'm blessed right now, and I, I really haven't grasped it yet, but um, just trying to focus on the work and, and, and stay humble and, and just enjoy the ride. So you um, think this is going to be a long-time career? Uh, 
Is that what you it's like? His will. Is that your desire? I'm gonna say it's his will, and okay. and just continue to work, and and if I just continue to make it about the work and um, separate that from me, and just be humble, I think I think I have some bright things coming up. Excellent, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be seeing you on the stage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having home. me. Thank You're you. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> Before we leave tonight. We have two pairs of tickets to the Milwaukee Rep to give away to two viewers who can correctly answer this question. Who played the part of Tom Robinson in the 1962 film version of To Kill a Mockingbird? If you know the answer, call 414-297-7556 or email us at viewerservices at mptv.org. Give us the answer, your name, phone number, and an address. Two of the winning responses will each receive a pair of tickets to see To Kill a Mockingbird. If you won tickets from us previously, you're not eligible for this drawing. And that wraps up this edition of Black Nouveau. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night and thanks for watching.